So, one week after Resurrection Day, and just four days, I think, after the end of the Passover season, because that was the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which started on uh, the day of crucifixion, or the day after, actually, and uh, lasted seven days. So we just have the Passover season behind us, and now we are in between Passover. Pentecost, Shavuot. And those are linked together because as soon as uh, first fruits, the resurrection day uh, dawns, uh, the counting begins seven weeks, seven times seven days. And then the 50th day is, of course, Pentecost. All these days are marked on God's calendar ages before. And this Passover season is really something uh, yeah, you cannot stop talking about because it's actually the most important thing in all of Scripture. It's the most important thing in all of history. That is um, um, how God um, redeemed us and uh, gave us back life, an eternal life. So I want to still um, look at Passover today and one and a half week ago, I think it was, uh, we saw how there are different events throughout history that we can find in Scripture that happen on the exact days that mark um, either the day of crucifixion or resurrection or even the day of um, what we now call Palm Sunday. And there is, uh, there is one more that is so uh, profound that... Uh, I want to look at it as well. Um, when Jesus had his, uh, his, his final Passover with his disciples, it was the 14th of Nisan. And it's always a bit confusing because we read in Scripture it was the evening of, of that day. For in our perception, that is the end of the day. We first have the day and then we have the evening. On the Hebrew calendar, the evening is where the day begins. Then you have the night and then the whole day. And then at sunset the next day, so then the next day begins. So the 14th of Nisan is at the end of the 13th, the evening, what we would consider the evening of the 13th, but that is actually the beginning of the 14th. So he had his last supper on the 14th, the evening. And um, after that, later that night, he was arrested. The morning following that, which was still the 14th, was uh, his trial and the crucifixion began. And later that afternoon, he died on the cross. And that evening, before the end of the 14th, he was taken off the cross. So this is all in the 14th. For us, it would spend two days, but in the, in the Hebrew calendar, this was all on one day. And so I just tell this because it's important for what we're going to read. Um, that day, that exact day, God had, had appointed that day even before the foundation of the earth. And it's almost, if you read scripture and you study, it's almost as if God could not wait to give this gift of, of salvation to, to his people. And, and he's showing it. It's like when you have a surprise for someone, you, you want to, to tell it, you want to give it, you can't wait. It's a bit like that. And um, there is one event that gives uh, a very perfect foreshadow of everything that would happen on, on that 14th of Nisan. And for that we need to go back um, to Exodus. And as a starting point, we will even go further back, but we will start there. And we go to Exodus 12, verse 40, and 242. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. The last verse, verse 42, that we read, it talks about a night. This is interesting. 
but we come back to that. But it says here 430 years after another event, this happened. The day they left was 430 years after something else. And even, it says, on the self-same day. So it was on the exact same day, same date, you could say, on the calendar, but 430 years later. So what do we want to know, what it, where I want to go, is to see what happened 430 years before that on the self-same day, on the exact same day. And we know when they left Egypt, eh? we know, because it was the, the, was the night of Passover, the, so the eve of the 14th day, killed the lamb, they put the blood on the doorpost, that night death passed over, and the firstborn in Egypt died. The following day, they began to gather the gold and the silver from the, from the Egyptians and to, to get ready. And at the end of that day, the end of the 14th, when the 14th went into the 15th, that's when they left, at night it says. So they didn't leave right away the following morning. It actually couldn't be because we, we read that there are things happened. So it took time. So towards the end of the day. So if you parallel that with the crucifixion, when they had the, ate their Passover lamp, it was the same time when Jesus had his last supper, when death passed over that night and into the following day. That was when Jesus was arrested and crucified. And towards the end of the day, when Jesus was taken off the cross, that was when they began to leave Egypt. And that's, of course, also when the Feast of Unleavened Bread began. Which uh, they had, uh, by the way, I uh, thought of this uh, uh, later, I didn't mention it uh, last week, but they had enough unleavened bread with them that if they would have taken the shortest route to Canaan, they would have had enough food with them had for about 11 days, the, 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 the Feast of Unleavened Bread last seven days, and they would have had enough. It's about 11 days to walk along the coast, Sinai, into Gaza. They could have made it, theoretically. But God had it differently, of course. But anyway, that's a side note. So, um, what happened 430 years prior to this on the exact same day? Because it's it's... From this we can see that God had already done something on that same day. This is not the real first Passover, apparently. And to find out, we have to go to the New Testament, which is a kind of a surprise. Um, and I want to make up a bit, because last Tuesday I read only from the New Testament. That was really exceptional. Now we're going to read mostly from the Old Testament, but now... For this, we have to go to Galatians, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God, before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of non-effect. Okay, a bit difficult sentence, but two things jump out. First of all, that the promise that God made to Abram, his covenant was in Christ. So even there was no mentioning of Christ or knowledge of Christ among men, but it was in Christ, and we will see that it is indeed so. And then he says, it was confirmed by giving the law, which happened 430 years after. So from the moment that God made the covenant with Abram, 430 years after that, God confirmed it by giving the law. So when was the law given? It was given 50 days after the Israelites left Egypt. On Mount Sinai, the law was given to Moses. That was the confirmation of the promise made to Abraham. So we know now that 430 years before the Israelites left Egypt, the covenant was made with Abraham. That's the year. But the day was not... 
Pentecost, which it was Pentecost, of course, uh, the, when the law was given, the day was the self-same day as they left Egypt. That's what we just read from Exodus 12. So Paul here gives the year, but in Exodus we read the exact day. So the day the covenant was made with Abram was on the 14th of Nisan, on what we know as Passover. It was the self-same day they left Egypt. So knowing this, it's interesting to now look at what did God do when he made the covenant with Abram. And we will see that where it began, it also ends, because when Jesus dies on the cross, that fulfills the first covenant. The covenant made with Abram is fulfilled there. And at the same time, the new covenant is, is sealed. So it both comes together there. So we go back now to Genesis, chapter 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. Here we see, um, and we will read on uh, in a minute, but this is the, actually the, the night before the covenant was made with Abram. So this was the, the eve of the 14th, the night of the Last Supper. Okay. And what do we have here? We have a priest of God. This was, of course, long before priesthood was established. The, the, priesthood through the Levites, uh, priest in the order of Melchizedek. And what did he do? He brought bread and wine to Abraham. And of course now you begin to see what's, what's going on here. And it also mentions that Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Now what is Salem? Very good. Peace. Hey, it's Shalom. It's this word. But he was king of Salem. Here it's always called kings. Today we would call this a mayor because Salem was a town. It was not a country, it was a town. And it was the town that later would become Jerusalem. It's the very same town. <laughs> then it was small. Um, but that's what it is. And um, it, would, uh, it would be called Salem until David's time. And that's when it changed. And we can find this actually in Psalm uh, 76, verse 2. It says there, In Salem also is his tabernacle, and his dwelling place in Zion. So we have here both the, the city where the tabernacle stood, and the temple later, and the country, Zion, Israel. Now, I will come back to this uh, Tuesday, Lord willing. But there's a purpose that I show this from Psalm 76 or from any scripture. Almost everything that we, well, everything actually that is relevant, we can find in scripture, the proof. It's not that, uh, for example, I would go to Wikipedia and see what is Salem and then use that as a source. The source is scripture always. So it proves itself, and that's it's very important. It's all in God's word. Um, so that's Salem, and Melchizedek was the, the, the king of Salem. Now, what about Melchizedek himself? And we go once again to the New Testament, to Hebrews 5, verse 8 through 10. And I think we know this scripture very well, because it mentions there Melchizedek speaks here about Jesus. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is called a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Not a priest, a high priest. Melchizedek was, of course, a priest. But we saw also before when we studied uh, this, this priesthood that um, as, as Christians we ought to be at least priests. We are actually um, typified in the Old Testament by priests. And Jesus is then the high priest. Now, he's not a high priest because he's a Levite and he, he 
inherited this, uh, this title, so to speak, but he is because he's appointed by God. That is the order of Melchizedek. That is a whole different type of priesthood. And uh, we know of, of this Melchizedek character nothing actually <laughs> except this. Um, but we find something similar later also uh, when Moses um, flees Egypt and he goes to, um, what is it, Midian, I think, eh? or, uh, where he ends up with Jethro, who is also a priest. But there is no priesthood yet, so he most, most uh, likely was also a priest of this, this order, of this type, because he was serving God. So we have here... We go back to Genesis. We have here um, the, the eve of Passover. We have a priest who is a type of Jesus in Jerusalem. Actually, they were north of Jerusalem. It says in verse uh, Genesis 14, verse 17, they were at the valley of Shaveh, which is just north of Jerusalem. So we have a priest who is a type of Jesus on the eve of Passover in, in Jerusalem who is offering bread and wine. So this is, this is a picture of the Last Supper that we see here. It's on the sec exact same day, in the same place. And from that we can see here, God is already showing what he's going to do at a, at a Passover 2,000 years later. And, and in between, we have, of course, the Exodus following the same pattern as well. And it was evening, it says also. Eh? We know it was the same day, it was the same time. And so after the Holy Supper... The things continue, just as we know from the New Testament. And so we go to Genesis 15, verse 7 through 10. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. So this is a very weird ritual that we read here. Uh, we talked about it before, but I will go into it a bit deeper now, because it's relevant Everything is relevant always. We know all these details are. So the, the bread and wine was given by Melchizedek on the evening, the 14th. And now we see that God tells um, Abram to take these animals and divide them. Now, it was not that he um, could just uh, walk uh, to wherever next to him and get these animals. He had to go and search them. It's very specific these specific animals, and also three years old, so it takes time. Then he had to kill them and divide them. So this implies that it was, it was day, it was light. So this was most likely the following morning, after that night where he received bread and wine from Melchizedek, which, which actually makes sense because we skipped a few verses, but if you read it, it makes sense. So this would be the day of the 14th, the day that parallels the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. And now, why does God ask him to take these specific animals? And they had to be three years old. And then he had to divide them into two parts and put them in two rows. Well, first of all, we see um, a heifer which is, uh, which is a beast of burden. It's like a bullock. Yeah. This points actually to Christ as being the servant. A heifer is a servant. So it points to Christ being the servant. And from the heifer we know it was used in agriculture, but it was also later used as a sacrificial animal. So it's a servant both of man and of God. And then there was the goat. Now, a goat is typically used for sin offering. We find out later, of course. Sin offering. And thus it points to Christ as sin offering. 
he died for our sins. And it was a she-goat, it was a female. This is very strange because always, almost, uh, we read about male uh, animals as uh, sacrificial animals. The, the female shows, again, um, the submission. It's a submission to the father, which is emphasized here by having um, a female animal. You could go deeper in going even back to, to Eve and the origin of sin, but okay, that's... Maybe a bit much, uh, uh, maybe a bit philosophic, but it, there is a point there. And then there is the ram. And a ram, you can read in Exodus 29, a ram was used for the consecration of priests. And thus it points to Christ's consecration as priest, but also his consecration to God. He was consecrated to God, to the Father. So the heifer, the goat and the ram, they all had to be three years old. Also this is different from what we find out later, where um, the animals have to be one year and uh, unblemished and all this. Here we have the number three. And three is of course the number of resurrection. On the third day Jesus rose from the dead. So. Abram has to kill these animals, but in the number of years, the age they have, there is uh, the resurrection implied. And then there are uh, two other animals, the turtle dove and a young pigeon. And these are birds. And birds are creatures of the air. They are heavenly, and they point to Christ being heavenly. So all the previous point to him as the son of man, but this points to him as being the son of God. Even though he became man, he never ceased to be the son of God. And actually, he died as man, but he never died as being the son of God. That's why you see that these two birds are not split in half. The other animals are, but the birds are not. They are left intact. That's why you also see that of the birds, it's not said they have to be three years old. Because there's no resurrection in the heavenly part, because there's no death in the heavenly part. So on that day, Abram had to go out and find these specific animals, but also to make sure that they were three years old. It was not something he would quickly do. It might have taken quite a few hours to, to get all this uh, arranged, and then he had to kill them and, and cut them in half. And, to cut a, a heifer in half is also not something you do in 10 minutes. <laughs> this is a big animal. So th th this took time. This took him maybe the larger part of the day to get this done. And this all parallels the trial of Jesus, Jesus going through Jerusalem with a cross on, on his back, being crucified. Um, this is all paralleled by these events here. And, and the division, and I will come back to it in a minute, but the division, it also shows that Christ was divided. He was, um, as a man, he was uh, divided on the cross, but only as a man, not, not his heavenly part. And so here we are now towards the end, the later part of the day, the afternoon of the 14th. And then it continues in Genesis 15, verse 12 through 14. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. What have we just read? The, the sun was going down. And then it says a great darkness appeared in verse 12. Great darkness fell upon him. This is later repeated in verse 17, which we will read in a minute. And this should ring a bell. 
because what happened when Jesus was on the cross from the sixth until the ninth hour, there was a great darkness that, that came. So we see again this parallel here. The darkness came just before Jesus' death. So this you can read in, in Matthew uh, 27, verse 45. The darkness, when Jesus was on the cross, was lasted three hours. And here, during this, this sleep, God is, is telling Abram that his descendants would be taken captive into Egypt, would serve there, and then after 400 years would, would come out in, with a great multitude. What happened just before they would leave um, Egypt, just before that Passover, God had sent nine plagues upon the Egyptians. The ninth plague, the last plague, was what was darkness. Three days of extreme darkness. They could not even make light. It would not help. They would have only darkness. It lasted three days. So that, that was just before the death of the firstborn. Just like Jesus, three hours of darkness before his death. And here we see also darkness. It doesn't say how long, but that's darkness. But it's, it parallels each other. And we will see it again. Well, we not, I hope. But it will happen again during the tribulation period. There is again darkness. Um, actually, it's mentioned twice. Uh, once um, at the, the sixth seal, which is Revelation 6, verse 12, and then at the fourth trumpet uh, judgment again, Revelation 8, 12. And, and Jesus also speaks about this in Matthew 12, when, he say, when the, the scribes and the Pharisees ask for a sign. He says, uh, you hypocrites, you can't. Tell them whether you you want a sign. Only sign that you will get is the sign of Jonah, who was three days in the belly of the whale. This is why many think that the darkness mentioned in Revelation will also be three days, just like in Egypt. And it might very well be that it will happen on the same days. Who knows? Now you might think, well, Abram after getting these animals, dividing them. He was now tired and he went to sleep. But it's not what it says. Uh, the sun was just going down, which means it was still early. It was just uh, uh, yeah, early in the evening. And a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Now, if you read here this in the Hebrew, uh, it uses the same word that I mentioned last week with regards to Adam. It's this word radam, which is a death-like sleep. It, the same word is used actually for death also, when you die. It's like coma. It's, it's, a, it's like as if God made him being dead, as being dead. And of course, when we talked about it last week, it was also a parallel to Jesus, because Abram was put in this deep sleep, his side was opened, a rib was taken out, from which life came, which paralleled the piercing of the side of Jesus. Here we see the same thing. It's this, this death that comes. Jesus died on the cross, and during the, his death, new life was actually uh, given for mankind. And so here we see the same thing. Now, um, the question is, of course, uh, if you have never studied this, uh, we have, but in any case, why would he divide these animals to begin with? Yeah, because God told him so. But then you would think Abram might have said, why do I need to do this? But he just did it, as if it was a common thing to him. And actually it was. It was a, a, a custom among Chaldeans, Mesopotamia, where Abram was from, that if you would make a covenant, that they would take an animal and split it in half, put the two halves on the floor, and both parties that made the covenant would go in between. And the idea was that if one would break the, com the covenant, he would have the same fate as the animal. So it was a very strong uh, confirmation of the covenant. So by, by doing this, Abram knew, knew God is going to confirm his promise. Because Abram had asked, how do I know that I will inherit it? And so then God told him to do this. So in his mind, he must have understood, well, God will, will seal this covenant with me. And there is actually an, um, 
also scripture. So here you see it again. Scripture confirms this. It's not only uh, history that's, that from which we know this custom, but uh, in Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 18, uh, we can actually read it. And I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had made before me, when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts thereof, the princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the Enochs and the priests and all the people of the land which passed between the parts of the calf, I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life. And their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of heaven and to the beasts of the earth. So here we see the uh, reference to this custom of cutting an animal in two, going in between, as sealing the covenant. And so Abram knew this custom, and so it was not strange for him to do this. The only th strange thing probably was that it had to be these specific animals and not just one calf. So knowing this, basically, it's a covenant between God and Abram. So God would have to go in between these two halves, and Abram would have to go in between these two halves. That is how it works. So what is going to happen uh, here? Uh, we can uh, we go back to Genesis 15. In verse 17, we read what happens. Again, Abram is in this deep sleep. So he sees all this now in his sleep. In his death-like sleep. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Abram. So here the sun has gone down, which means now the 15th has begun. And a smoking furnace and a burning lamp. Two things pass between the two halves. That's what Abram sees. And it says that, that day, that same day, God made a covenant. Parallel that to Jesus on the cross when he died, when he had died, actually when he was in the tomb. That's when God sealed the covenant covenant it was through his death whereas um, the, the old covenant this covenant here with Abram was was con was fulfilled at that same moment so what does the smoking furnace and the burning lamp represent and uh, scripture tells us literally and um, yeah that's that's what I, I like from this um, translation, this King James, because it's very consistent in using the same words throughout all of Scripture. Whereas if I go to other, tra other translations, you read one word here and then another expression there, you cannot make the link. But f here we will see uh, how, what is meant with the smoking furnace and the burning lamp. Um, so these are the, the terms that are being used here. Smoking furnace, burning lamp. And so we go first to uh, Isaiah 62, verse 1. Yes. For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns. The burning lamp is the salvation that God brings, which we know is Jesus. And actually, if you would read on here, you will find out that it talks about Jesus, even into chapter 63, which we read a while ago. It talks about the second coming of Jesus, bringing salvation upon Israel and the remnant of the Jewish people. So it speaks clearly in context about Jesus and uses this term burning lamp, which is not strange. We know this. He is the light on our path. So it's, it's actually, we, we know it also from Psalms and um, also from the New Testament where he is called the light of the world. The burning lamp is Jesus. And now you see also the link the, 
with what Paul writes uh, to the Galatians, where he says this covenant made with Abram was in Christ. Even there, the full Godhead was at work. So that's the burning uh, lamp. So what is the smoking furnace? This we can read in Exodus 19, verse 18. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. The smoking furnace is God. And the detail is that there was also an earthquake here, just like when Jesus died on the cross. But that's a side note. But so, the smoking furnace is God the Father, and the burning lamp is Jesus, his son. So if we go back now to the, the ritual of cutting this animal in, in two and going in between, both parties would go in between, which would be God and Abram. However, God knows Abram is just a man like any other man. He would not be able to keep up this covenant. He represents, of course, his descendants, which is also us. And so God sends his son instead. So through Jesus, God is already here at the, at the beginning of the first covenant. He is confirming it uh, or sealing it through his son. This happened the same night that about 2,000 years later, Jesus would be in the tomb, would be dead, like Abram was quote-unquote dead. And so we see that the words that Paul uses in the letter to the Galatians, they get a whole different layer of meaning. He's not merely speaking about what happened so long ago with Abram. He speaks also about what happens on the cross, what happened on the cross. It was the confirmation of the covenant, or the fulfillment actually, of the covenant made with Abram, making, uh, realizing it, not through descendancy, not through bloodline, being literal sons of Abram, as the scribes and the Pharisees were claiming, but through justification by faith. And so it gives a whole different meaning to it. And we see how perfect, uh, again, God put everything together in events, uh, also even the place where it happened, the date, the day, even the hours on which everything happened. And it's a gift of grace that God is giving to Abram. Because what Abram um, uh, asks and the covenant he has to make, he's impossible uh, to, to do this as a man. It's all by grace. And of course, God shows its grace when he changes Abram's name into Abraham, adding the heth, the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is, <coughs> which is the number of grace, pointing to the five wounds of Jesus. It's all grace. <coughs> and that is what we inherit. That is how the first covenant uh, applies also to us and not to those that literally are descendants of, um, of Abram by bloodline. It's, uh, justification by faith, and it's a gift of grace. And so we see that Jesus is our Passover by both fulfilling and renewing God's covenant, fulfilling the first covenant, renewing it into the, the new covenant, all by grace. Thank you.